Hello, my name is Dr. Ralph DeFranco, and I am Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Diabetes Division at the University of Texas Health Science Center in the Audie L. Murphy VA Hospital in San Antonio, Texas. I also serve as the Deputy Director of the Texas Diabetes Institute. The ominous octet is a phrase that I used in the Banting Lecture at the American Diabetes Association meeting in 2008 to refer to the eight core defects implicated in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes mellitus. In this presentation, I will review each of the eight core defects and discuss which ones are affected by GLP-1. When I gave the Lilly Lecture in 1987 at the American Diabetes Association annual meeting, I talked about the triumvirate, which consisted of defects in the liver, in the muscle, and in the beta cell. We know that people who are destined to develop type 2 diabetes inherit a set of genes that make their tissues, particularly the liver and the muscle, very resistant to insulin. Early in the natural history of the disease, the beta cell is healthy and can secrete sufficient amounts of insulin to offset the insulin resistance in liver and muscle. However, with time, the ability of the beta cell to secrete insulin declines. As the insulin response declines, the insulin resistance in liver becomes manifest by an overproduction of glucose throughout the sleeping hours, which accounts for fasting hyperglycemia. Following a meal, the majority of the carbohydrate in the meal, particularly glucose, is taken up and disposed of in the muscle. In the face of muscle insulin resistance, the decline in insulin secretion leads to postprandial hyperglycemia. Thus, in 1987, the etiology of type 2 diabetes was quite simple. Insulin resistance in liver, insulin resistance in muscle, and progressive beta cell failure. However, we know that there are at least five additional defects that need to be addressed. To the right, we know that the fat cell is very resistant to insulin. Insulin is an anti-lipolytic hormone. It blocks the breakdown of triglycerides. Because the fat cell is resistant to insulin, it is constantly breaking down the triglycerides and releasing free fatty acids into the bloodstream. Elevated free fatty acid levels lead to insulin resistance in the liver and muscle, increased hepatic gluconeogenesis, and decreased insulin secretion. Thus, it exacerbates the three core defects present in individuals with type 2 diabetes. We have come to recognize that the gut is a major endocrine organ, as shown at the lower right. In response to food intake, the gut releases two very important incretin hormones. One is glucon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1, and the other is glucose-dependent insulinotrophic polypeptide, referred to as GIP. These two incretin hormones are responsible for about 70% of the insulin that is secreted in people without diabetes in response to a typical meal. We know that in patients with type 2 diabetes, there is a modest decrease in the amount of GLP-1 that is secreted, and more importantly, the beta cells are severely resistant to the stimulatory effects of GLP-1 and GIP, thus reducing insulin secretion. At the bottom, we know that the alpha cell also plays a very important role in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Although we know that the alpha cell hypersecretes glucagon, the role of glucagon in fasting hyperglycemia is often underappreciated. Patients with type 2 diabetes have elevated fasting plasma glucagon levels. In addition, glucagon levels are not appropriately suppressed in response to a meal and in fact, there may be a paradoxical rise in plasma glucagon levels. We also know that the liver is hypersensitive to the elevated glucagon levels. Therefore, the increase in plasma glucagon, together with the deficiency of insulin, leads to excess hepatic glucose production and impairment of the normal suppression of hepatic glucose production after a meal. On the bottom left, we have also come to learn that the kidney plays an important role in the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. People without diabetes 
would start to excrete glucose into the urine when the blood sugar level exceeds about 180 milligram per deciliter, and this would protect them from an excessive rise in the blood glucose level. In patients with type 2 diabetes, the threshold for spilling glucose into the urine is substantially increased, and this contributes to the maintenance of hyperglycemia. As shown on the left, alterations in neurotransmitters in the brain that are involved in regulating appetite, such as serotonin, catecholamines, and dopamine, contribute to dysregulation of appetite and excess caloric intake. In addition, the GLP-1 receptor is present in areas of the brain involved in appetite regulation. GLP-1 is an important physiologic regulator of caloric intake and decreases hunger and increases the feelings of fullness and satiety. In type 2 diabetes, resistance to the appetite suppressive effects of GLP-1, as well as insulin and leptin, contributes to weight gain. Importantly, excess caloric intake and weight gain are associated with insulin resistance in muscle, insulin resistance in the liver, and beta cell failure. GLP-1 receptor agonists address many of the core defects present in type 2 diabetes by mimicking the effects of native GLP-1. First, exogenous GLP-1 receptor agonists replace any deficiency of GLP-1 secretion by the L cells in the gut. Second, because GLP-1 receptor agonists are given at pharmacologic doses, they overcome the GLP-1 resistance at the level of the beta cell and augment insulin secretion. Third, GLP-1 receptor agonists inhibit the hyposecretion of glucagon by the alpha cell. This is of critical importance because approximately 50% of the excessive basal rate of hepatic glucose production in patients with type 2 diabetes is attributable to enhanced glucagon secretion and or increased hepatic sensitivity to glucagon. Fourth, we know that there is excessive hepatic glucose production in patients with type 2 diabetes. By increasing insulin and inhibiting glucagon secretion, GLP-1 receptor agonists reduce hepatic glucose production. Fifth, GLP-1 receptor agonists work centrally to inhibit appetite and food intake, leading to weight loss. Sixth, by causing weight loss, GLP-1 receptor agonists have the ability to improve insulin sensitivity in muscle. In conclusion, I have addressed several key features underlying the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, many of which can be improved by GLP-1 receptor agonists. With scientific advancements, our understanding of the core defects in type 2 diabetes will continue to evolve and further clarify the role and importance of GLP-1. I would like to thank all of you today for listening in, and I hope that the knowledge that you have gained about the core defects underlying the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes mellitus will be of help as you go forward in the treatment of your patients.